I'm not sure what happened. It says you're live now. So it's, it, should, it gave me a different notification. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, all right. Here we are. Hello and welcome, everyone. My name is Namroop Sethev, and I'm the founder and CEO of The Digital Economist, which is a global impact platform focused on building knowledge, uh, products, and services for a human-centered digital economy. I'm also a fellow at MIT Connection Science uh, since the past four years, where we convene some of the top experts in the world and, and, and use emerging technologies to solve some of the biggest problems in the world. So I'm joined by a very esteemed panel today. Uh, we have Swetlana joining in from California, though she's from, um, from Tokyo, Japan, uh, and William, uh, William, you have to tell me where you're joining from. Uh, Minneapolis, but, oh, Minnesota. Minnesota, there you go. So uh, interestingly enough, uh, you know, with the Asia Summit, with a, a very globalized world now more than anything uh, with the pandemic, uh, a, a really globally sp a spread panel, but certainly you could see a heavy representation from the U.S. Uh, well, I guess it, for me, I could say that I'm born and raised in India, which is in Asia, so I think that's my bragging rights for the panel today. Um, but uh, we're focused on uh, the Asian AI potential for this discussion. So I will just go ahead and invite everybody to introduce themselves Tell us a little bit about what they do and how they're actually engaged. And again, you'd see a, a very action oriented. These are folks who are uh, working on the topics we're going to be discussing today uh, before we dive into the uh, the actual discussion. So uh, thank you again for joining. Maybe Svetlana, we can start with yourself and uh, I invite you to introduce yourself and tell us uh, what you're working on. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Svetlana Kamoshanska. I'm based in California, Silicon Valley. My office is in San Francisco, but originally I'm from Russia. Um, so um, I'm an attorney, uh, licensed both in Russia and California, and um, I fo focus my practice on providing and supporting legal with legal services, tech companies, including AI tech. So basically, I'm a lawyer as well as startup advisor, and um, recently. I can see that a lot of technology have some kind of AI part in that. So a lot of companies deal with this one way or another. So that's why it became a, a subject of my interest, especially taking into account that I do a lot of international transactions and international um, kind of corporate uh, deals. And we usually have to deal with differences between the law, which is applicable to development of the process like data, uh, is one of that highly regulated area these days, and Asia is definitely, in that respect, is different from Europe and the U.S., right? So when we uh, have to deal with a global company, uh, we have to take into consideration uh, the applicable law, and sometimes uh, the country of origin of the product could be considered as a risk, from the investment standpoint and from the standpoint of bringing product to a new market. So that's my relationship with AI. And uh, I'll pass the word to the next speaker. Yeah, and I think Svetlana, before we move on to those here, you really kind of nailed and got to the core of it, which is data, right? Uh, data that's at the core of the digital economy and what powers all emerging tech, in particular AI. So talking about data, I think it's a great time though she to introduce yourself, um, introduce you here and uh, what you're doing. I know you have a super high growth startup out of Japan uh, doing very exciting things. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about it. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm, I'm Hidetoshi Uchiyama, uh, just call me Toshi, Toshi is fine. In long name, so and I I'm apologize for and, missing your name. I should have picked it up from uh, the last time. Oh, so, uh, thank you. So just come to she. Okay, I, I'm a founder and CEO of Uneri. Uh, Uneri is a Japanese word called the meaning is the big wave, very big wave. Uh, Uneri is the largest location based big data platform in Japan. We provide the location technology to major mobile applications such as the uh, coupon app and uh, map applications and so on. And we receive GPS location data from that apps. So the number of users is uh, 100, 110 million users, which is almost covers 80% of Japanese population. So based on that location, big data, 
we provide analysis and uh, advertisement service for retailers, consumer goods manufacturers, real estate companies, and so on. So today, I'm looks like I'm the only one who live in Asia at this moment. So uh, I'd like to share some thoughts regarding AI, especially on the human behaviors and the situation in Japan and in Asian countries. Thank you very much. Great. Yeah, we'll get into that. Uh, uh, in a second here. So William, last but not the least, I'm uh, delighted to invite you and uh, uh, to introduce yourself. Great. Yeah, of course. Uh, my name is William Palea. I have a consultancy out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Been uh, working with Asia or APAC for about 15 years now, um, primarily in three areas, uh, machine learning, robotics process management, and intelligent applications. Uh, Kind of getting early on the kind of the fourth industrial revolution um, and helping some of my clients be able to turn their cost management and their cost centers into a profit center. Um, and in the process, you know, adding and introducing AI into the mix um, that ended up being a lot more complicated. Uh, but I like I like challenges. Um, but I just. You know, it, the industrial revolution is upon us, you know, the need for us and everyone to kind of accelerate, you know, their technology adoption, kind of future proofing their economies is so important. Um, you know, it, that's basically what I do. I solve tactical pains for companies um, and kind of delivering that near term value that people are looking for. You know, they want to be able to see quick results. They want to they want to have that long term roadmap, but they want to have those short milestones and, you know, I help facilitate that through consulting um, and basically helping with contact centers, forecasting, document management for, uh, you know, a number of large companies uh, in the Asia Pacific region. Um, I get into it more, but uh, but I, well, I'm sure we'll be doing that soon. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. Uh, very, uh, sure. you know, very focused uh AI and, and related domains, uh, you know, I think as, as a quick observation from the panel here, um, you know, there's a lot we could go into. We can talk about the potential of AI. We can talk about the downsides of AI. We can talk about the biases in AI, you know, really timely topics, uh, standards in AI. But, you know, just to kind of, I guess, anchor us and just, uh, you know, keep the scope of this panel uh, uh, you know, a little bit more tight, if you may. Um, you know, what I'd love to focus on is talk about some of the uh, the socioeconomic uh, aspects of using, deploying AI at scale, uh, starting with perhaps the management of data, uh, which Svetlana, I think you uh, advise firms on on an everyday basis, starting with obviously the legal, right? Um, uh, which again is broader than just the general governance and regulatory um, aspects. Uh, and then kind of go a little bit deeper into when we're looking at AI at scale in perhaps the the most dense dense uh, continent on on the planet, which is which is Asia, right? And so um, and maybe we can kind of go in the same order. So so kind of would love to share. Um, uh, it would be great if you could share some of your thoughts on how you look at uh, some of this regulatory, uh, you know, differences between, as you previously mentioned, um, in working with, you know, uh, companies out of US and Europe and, and then Asia in particular, and where you would say we need to be more careful when we're looking at the socioeconomic impacts of AI at scale. Thank you, um, so sure. I think, first of all, I, I want to emphasize that there are regulations and applicable law to data and like collection and processing. And there is a social effect of that. And those processes are not necessarily correlated on the same level. Uh, unfortunately, or I don't know, that's what we have. Technology develop, we, we, we observe that technology grows and develops itself faster than the law can follow. So basically, uh, when we first, when the car was implemented or created, we had almost 100 years to develop rules how it should be regulated, right? Right now, we kind of um, <laughs> go with the flow. We don't have regulations. And uh, from my observation, Europe does a wonderful job in kind of trying to protect the interests of the people who live in Europe. 
Um, U.S. follows, but definitely Asia. I mean, I don't want to generalize, but we know that China is a huge market for the AI development at this point of time. And uh, unfortunately, I think the privacy law in China was just adopted a few years ago. So we cannot really uh, say that China really cares about how the data is um, obtained, processed, and um, what the social impact is. That's number one thing. The second thing I think it's important, and I always uh, talk with my clients about that, is the purpose of the company, right? And I think it's important to remember for our slash professionals who advise clients, are we purpose-driven or like profit-driven? If we purpose-driven, then we would take into consideration social effect of technology more than just profit-driven companies. And uh, that's a different mentality. Maybe I'm biased. I like Silicon Valley. Definitely, I think a lot of founders in Silicon Valley are dreamers. They create company because they have vision. But I see other types of companies, right? So I see companies that um, want to get the product as soon as possible here now without really considering what the long-term effect, right? What is the so social impact uh, in the long run? So that's kind of the overview. And from the legal standpoint, I think, there are, like you, I can talk for hours about that. The, the, definitely, we have first the issue of data collection. Like I, when we spoke last time, I mentioned that, for instance, in Russia these days they implemented face um, pay. So the data that government basically collects is just tremendous and not everyone like not everyone most of the people don't understand what is going on right so there is no sufficient information enough education so people can understand the consequences of kind of giving up the data uh, and another thing is when we talk about technology there is a process of training the data right and then we come to the biases issues how do we train data like what is it diverse enough how we assess that and that's very important to take into consideration that's what i talk to my clients about because um there were a few cases when um u.s government basically um limit the access to the market based on the argument that the, the uh, data was like the ai is biased and it was like, I don't know, it was more probably political between Asia, China and the U.S. But nevertheless, that's a risk. And we have to really think through in the process of development uh, of the product. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Sultan. I think you've covered a, a lot of ground and, and brought to fore, in fact, a lot of issues. Um, and, and uh, uh, you know, again, things that uh, we, we deal with on an everyday basis. Um, and since Toshi, you're on the ground, I'd love for you to respond, perhaps even perhaps directly to some of the issues that Svetlana has uh, outlined here and really set us up for a, a very meaningful discussion today uh, before I uh, invite William back into the conversation to comment further on the, I guess, uh, <laughs> what it is to be, be in the US and work in the Asia Pacific region. So Toshi, over to you. Okay, so I, I have um, many uh, issues to, I want to share with you today, but uh, today I would just focus on the uh, Asian situation. Uh, in, in, especially in Japan, we have an, the problem of age, aging society. The the population aging rate is in Japan is is now twenty nine percent, which is obviously the highest rate in the in the world. And uh, meaning that the twenty percent uh, more uh, meaning that the twenty percent of Japanese population is more than sixty five years old. So AI uh, has a strong impact on our society to compensate for declining labor force. So for example, uh, there is a, an overwhelming shortage of young doctors for the uh, increasing number of elderly people. So now so many corporations have launched healthcare services which automatically diagnoses our daily diet, sleeps and exercise and provide health service at 
suitable for each individual. So this is uh, expected to reduce patients, also expected to reduce budget for the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. so, so another example is that uh, aut aut autonomous robots that can carry daily necessities such as meals and laundries and so on. It, it is also uh, equipped with a function to watch over the elderly and respond to emergencies. So aging rate or other Asian countries is rapidly rising and will become the same situation as Japan. So healthcare industry is, is imminent, I think. Interesting. And I think that's, uh, Japan is probably a bit of a special case in Asia because we actually have a huge uh, demographic dividend in other parts of Asia. Uh, you know, I think India probably has the biggest one uh, currently, but also yeah. Indonesia immediately following that, um, where we actually have the, um, uh, you know, the largest portion of the population in, in the working uh, uh, you know, um, age, if you may, I believe between uh, 20 to, uh, you know, 60, uh, but even more specifically between uh, 25 to 40, 45 um, to sort of, um, and, and then I think, um, I think Toshi, you mentioned a really interesting case with aging, um, but I'm also curious if, uh, you know, the Japanese case, and how do you kind of see working with the governments? I know you previously talked about uh, having shared some dislocation data with the Japanese government for contact tracing uh, for COVID. Um, and what kind of yeah. issues do you run into, or or do you run into any issues <laughs> uh, when it comes to okay. you know the socioeconomic impact of uh, the you right. know, data that you uh, have and manage? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so my company is about the location big data. So uh, the Japanese go government wants to reduce the amount of the human flow, so meaning that uh, they they do not want the Japanese population to go outside. So now I think the human fl human flow is about uh, less than half. And now it's uh, the number of infections every day is less than 200 in Japan. So it, it's working very well. And my company provides the location big data to Japanese government every day. And uh, so the government uh, the disclosed the, the human flows in every spot in Japan. And now in the Tokyo station is about 50% uh, and so on. And that works very well. So that's why now the situation is, it becomes very good. Great. Yeah, we'll come back to you on, on that. Uh, I think uh, uh, I'm curious to kind of learn a little bit more about as we get deeper into into the topic on some of the issues around ethics and uh, uh, and regulation and and also global standards. But I wanna I wanna invite William here to talk a little bit more about uh, some of the issues uh, that again I think. Svetlana has outlined. Do you run into similar issues, uh, William, as you're working with the Asia Pacific region? How do you reconcile the different standards when it comes to management of data uh, with, uh, you know, AI uh, and machine learning? Uh, we have a joke in in uh, at MIT, which is if you actually work on AI, uh, you call it machine learning. Everybody else calls it AI. Uh, uh, so there's a difference, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, with it, with uh, uh, my Asian clients, um, they're really focused with AI is mostly on revenue management, um, you know, uh, increasing profits. Um, that's about 80%, uh, you know, of, of their adoption of AI thus far. Um, I usually come in after they've already had a bad experience with somebody else. Um, that's one thing I've noticed that is very repetitive in the region. Um, there's just no ecosystem in place for AI to grow or to be measured, uh, rated. Um, and just that lack of, of knowledge, people hear AI, or I said with machine learning and like, okay, we need to adopt this somehow. And they go and they, and they, spend a lot of money and a lot of effort without a focus. You know, they're just trying to broadly, you know, adopt AI into their business and try to have it, you know, increase their revenue. And um, that's a problem because 
you know, a lot of the solutions that are out there, I'm not going to mention the big companies, but um, other than it falling down to the data, um, you know, each region, it has very unique uh, needs and concerns and wants. And, you know, they're very different uh, that I've noticed from my clients in Europe and America. Um, you know, now they're basically focused more on cost management you know, implementing, you know, HR strategies for, you know, lessening attrition or, you know, the the customer experience, et cetera, but not really thinking about revenue management because they figured that, you know, if you do that, the money will come. Um, That is something that was very in very short supply in the Asia Pacific uh, region uh, for many reasons. And so they come to me, they're like, okay, how do we focus on including, you know, cost management or that productivity and efficiency into our roadmap and, and have it have those milestones that will keep people engaged and want to continue to develop it. And, uh, and I, I consistently hit about three challenges. Um, one of them, as I had mentioned before, it's that fragmented ecosystem or e- lack of it. I mean, if you're in Singapore or in Thailand, you know, uh, there's, there are a lot of resources, but if, as soon as you go out, and it's kind of like here in Minnesota, too. I mean, it's a city, but then as soon as you go out for half an hour, you know, you're in the middle of the woods. And um, there's not a lot of IT and a, not a lot of um, resources for people. And, um, you know, Asia, a lot of them are, are like small to medium-sized enterprises. And so they're not going to be able to have access to a lot of the things that the big guys play with. Um, and, again, that's where I come in. Um, As you said, it's about acquiring that good data and its governance, um, collection, the use, you know, uh, regulation, security, et cetera. But the biggest one is definitely that that user resistance to AI, you know, the fear that it's going to take away your job. And so what we do is we come in and we have ready made solutions that are basically plug and play. Um, You don't need to have deep learning experience to be able to deploy or even have get any sort of meaningful information from it. we have it so that you kind of learn as you go. Um, you know, you kind of learn about it as you use it and be, and become subject matter experts, um, which is great. Uh, and the other positive thing is, is that STEM is really becoming big in school. And so graduates are easily able to transition, you know, to AI related uh, careers, you know, as long as they have that STEM education. Um, and a good example would be AI Singapore. Um, you know, they have an apprenticeship for reskilling and outplacement services and solutions. And, you know, that, that is very, very helpful. And because they kind of be able, they, they need to be like, okay, you know, we know that, that customer service is a cost center. You know, we really want to be able, if we're going to spend money, we want to be able to see profits. We want to be able to see change in the short term. And sales and revenue generation is really, you know, that's top line. Um but what I was able to show to them and, you know, there are other companies, too, is that you can make a profit from your cost center um, by making it more intelligent, you know, making it more self-service, um, having it be more intelligent in, um, you know, what is offered to you so that you can make better decisions and instead of it just being like a generic, uh, you know, like, oh, if you like this here, have that, you know, have it be more meaningful and based on, you know, your experience with the solution or with the company. And, uh, you know, boy, at the end of my meetings, every single time, it's basically every stakeholder, you know, has a role to play in this. Um, you sure, you, you really need to focus on impact. But, you know, if you mention every single sector, you know, government, you know, uh, uh, the solution providers themselves, you know, we all can play a part in getting that, you know, that, that accelerating that adoption. Because, you know, when we do that, it's going to make things a lot better. You know, there's a lot of... Um, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, they call it FUD, uh, with any type of new or emerging technology. You know, people want to be able to see proof before they're willing to dip their toe in the water. And I think Asia is really poised to to have a significant impact in, in the coming years, in the coming decade. And uh, it's very, I like seeing more competition every time I go in and speak with a company that's had a bad experience. And I tell you, in the beginning, I was the only game in town. <laughs> and it was just like, wow, I was like, what can you do for me? And, you know, basically for a lot of these companies, I do kind of white label consulting for them. Mm-hmm. You know, I kind of work with them behind the scenes so that they can go and, and, and tell the world and their companies, you know, what their plans are going to be. And then, and then I go off to somebody else. But um, I am very optimistic on the future of AI in Asia. Um, they, it's going to, it's going to be a significant 
it's going to have a significant change in, in the in the near future. Um, you know, aside from any issues, uh, you know, with you know personal privacy and et cetera. You know, that's something that I I don't cover. You know, but mm-hmm. but I can definitely see. I know I've worked with with uh, some companies that you know it's kind of the wild west, so to speak, in the American terms. Yeah. yeah, indeed. So. Indeed. Yeah, I think, again, uh, William, I, you brought in a perspective that uh, uh, it's it's hard to call it distinctly American because the fear of AI and, you know, the the economic transformation of the economy, which is imminent every few uh, years, if, if not uh, decades, um, has this backlash effect. As, as somebody who's been living here since the past six years, we're starting to see um, you know, more of that in Europe as well, but that's really interesting. On the other hand, I think the Asian problem is probably the opposite. And maybe that's something, Toshi, you could probably speak more to. Um, I haven't lived in India since the past eight years, but uh, there it's more about jumping head first without understanding the full implications of the technology. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, the universal ID system of India called Adhar, which is the Hindi word for foundation, to serve as a way to consolidate public services, uh, was <laughs> was a disaster from a, from a data privacy and uh, uh, you know perspective and and just the kind of uh, you know our, our handling of that because the governments are not ready again from a cybersecurity perspective to handle sensitive data. Uh, you know, down to the fingerprints, and I believe in some cases, retina scans as well. So that drew a lot of international attention. Uh, again, we're talking about the large democracy in the world, um, and uh, nothing like that at this scale has been implemented before, um, where, you know, I think in that sense, the global north, if you may, is slightly better kind of poised where there is, in fact, you know, discussion and debate and people on the other side um, who who would kind of... Um, you know, um, question how and in what ways the technology is being used and implemented and who's going to be affected and, and how. Um, so, you know, that's something that I, I kind of notice is, is different, uh, where, as you mentioned, William, it's a bit of a wild west and um, there aren't too many people talking about it. And it's now sort of starting to kind of gain attention as we see these uh, large-scale projects that many times go south. So, Toshi, maybe I'll, I can invite you here to comment on that a little bit here. Of course, Japan is a is an outlier as a as a developed country, if you may, out of Asia, but most of the Asia is not. So, you know, I'm curious to hear what is your take on, I guess, the the uh, the, the geopolitical, I guess, uh, you know, implications of of the technology itself. Okay. Um... So first, I want to mention about uh, the privacy law in the in Asian countries. In Japan, we have a, the uh, the personal information law, which is uh, com- uh, which comply with the uh, uh, the the level of the uh, the privacy law. It comply with the uh, CCPA and the GDPR. So that kind of level is only in Japan and uh, maybe in Singapore only. So mm-hmm. China has already started the new personal information law, but it's not comply with the GDPR, CCPI, CGPA, meaning that a lot of Asian countries, uh, the government wants to control the, the personal information. But in Japan and I think in Singapore, the, only the corporation wants to control. So the, the, the problem is that there's a battle between the Japanese government and the GAFA. The Google and the Facebook and so on. So the China can uh, strict, uh, can restrict the uh, market interest from the from the U.S. and Europe, but Japan doesn't have any, the strict the law. So there's a battle between the Japanese government and the GAFA, and we do not have any laws to restrict the, the GAFA's the personal information. So there's a problem in Japan, and I think uh, some countries in the, uh, other Asian countries. As it should be, I think as it should be, right? Because if you look at the, uh, if you look at corporations, there is no supranational mm. body to uh, guide and govern their behavior. They just do 
jurisdiction shopping and go wherever the rules are the most lax. On the other hand, governments only and exclusively have control over their sovereign territories and uh, you know governing their citizens and their activities. Um, and so we are in this complex world where uh, you know the the call for them to self govern. Uh, has been uh, getting louder and louder from all fronts. And I think perhaps nowhere else we saw this better uh, than COP26, the Conference of Parties, the UN Conference on uh, Climate Change earlier this month. Um, and, and, and yeah. you know, again, from a sustainability perspective, but again, we're looking at all technologies and, and including the use of AI at scale to deliver sustainability um, and goals, the sustainable development goals. And, and, and I think... That is, in fact, a problem in the rest of Asia that the governments are not sophisticated enough to be able to uh, not just regulate effectively, but also um, even engage in a meaningful sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, different perspective to say, oh, here's what we kind of want for our citizens. I'm all for, you know, deployment and adoption of the tech, but but not something that can become uh, the boss uh, and, and, you know, compromise on uh, citizen privacy and, and their rights. So maybe, Sultana, I can invite you here. <laughs> I'm sure you have a lot to say on this front. Um, and, and maybe we can talk a little bit about the solution space, if you may. Where do you see um, the solutions to come from when we are looking at the Asian context in particular when it comes to... So I... I I'm not a big believer that government is not sophisticated enough in order not to educate or promote, you know, privacy, data privacy and security. I think that's a choice that government makes, right, for one reason or another. So, um, and um, since I work with business, I think business has to understand that in order to be a global expand and it's really hard to stay within the boundary of one country these days especially if you develop technology or ai solution or something so uh it has to be my my vision the ideal vision is that it has to be some kind of international organization that would establish global ethical standards. We cannot regulate every step of development of the technology by the law at this point of time because we just cannot keep up with the pace. It has to be uh, yeah, the body that would implement the standards um, and force companies to think not just about this time profit. And it depends on the application of technology. If, like William described, like uh, optimization of a profit, that's one thing. If it's a dual-use technology, that's completely different uh, risk involved, right? And companies have to be aware of that first and have to understand what the consequences are if they develop the product in violation of the standards applicable across the globe. So I don't think it's, it could be achieved by specific governments. It has yeah, to I, be kind of international force, more business rather than anything else. Hmm. Excellent point. I think that's brilliant, Shatlana. And, and I think it's probably worthy of mentioning uh, IEEE has a committee with, uh, I'm, I, I know, upward of 500 people on ethics in AI uh, that has been working on this. Then the International Standard Organization, ISO, um, has all these standards. Of course, the uh, gold standard currently is around the GDPR um, and, you know, guidance in Europe, but also I know the EU has put forward uh, guidance on uh, the use of AI, and we're waiting for uh, similar guidance on blockchain, for example. So they've really been sort of taking the lead on this, uh, which is great. Um, you know, and, and again, I guess we could talk about other issues around it where we don't want once again uh, the, the global north to dictate or the global south how it should govern its population. So I can speak to that uh, for for a while as an economist uh, who started working at the UN Environment Program of SAT and WTO 
discussions and I've heard some of these debates and it's uh, it's uh, it's pretty <laughs> it's pretty bad uh, and I think we kind of saw that again with COP26 as well where it comes down to climate financing who is going to foot the bill right and and I think um, and it's slightly different I'm talking about a little tangential topic here uh, of course AI is intangible so we're not looking at physical assets but I think we do have to recognize the fact that uh, a lot of the economic value is currently coming from the digital economy uh, you know the the top companies and publicly uh, listed uh, companies and exchanges are uh, you know their biggest asset is data so how do we monetize that how do we handle that how do we govern that are critical issues and how we are um, you know looking at the impact of some of these uh, on uh, our socioeconomic um, uh, uh, you know uh, considerations and issues uh, do they exacerbate um, what we're already dealing with or do they solve these and, you know, at uh, at scale. So, Will, I'm curious to hear, um, I know you talked about, we have a few more minutes left in the call. I don't believe we have questions from the audience, so I would continue to uh, invite the panelists, but perhaps we can have uh, one last kind of extended comment from you before I invite everybody for sort of their closing remarks. I know you talked about bottom line, the bottom line, and uh, of course we have a very diverse panel here covering many of the other aspects. So how do you weigh these two? I'm curious to hear. Well, I mean, with my clients, it's, you know, they're really focused on revenue management, you know, about increasing profits. Um, you know, they come to me to be like, how can we, you know, make more of that and also take advantage of AI for cost management? And it's a lot more complicated than I thought it was going to be initially. Um, as you had said before, I mean, it seemed like, you know, uh, Europe and, and the Americas, you know, they, they seem to be a little more ahead on it uh, in, in certain aspects. So they kind of get the the pitch. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's a harder sell um, for me with, you know, some of the Asian countries to tell them, you know, hey, you know, we, we're, we need to automate, you know, back of the house. Um, we need to be able to, you know, take that data, make it more meaningful for your business and that it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be at the price of, um, of jobs. Um, that, that's the biggest thing. I mean, people are like, you know, I just, just I don't, I don't want to lose my job or I don't want to have my position be, you know, require a, a certain specialty or degree that, you know, is, um, you know, um, inaccessible, uh, to me. And, um, and, and, and that, that's been the big thing. I mean, the, the biggest issue that I've seen as far as data is concerned is it seems like no one is keeping an eye on it. And, you know, we're relying for these all these small businesses to have all this data. And it's just they have all this data, and it's just very dangerous. It's very dangerous. You know, I know there are companies out there that we'll call them companies, you know, that they just buy raw data from businesses. And they're like, you know, give it to us, give me everything. And then they have technology that goes through it and mines it. And and what are they finding in there? I mean, it, boy, I mean, even from, you know, from the, the early days of just going to a website and the information that they gather from you as a, a user, pre even pre-cookies, um, is enormous. And the thing is, you know, when you, when you do that at scale, you can get a lot of, of data out of it that may not necessarily be something that should be publicly accessible. And there is no regulation. There's no governing body that says, okay, this stuff is off limits. And that is the one wow. thing that's that consistent. That just gave me chills. What's that? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I said that just gave me chills as you were talking. And well, I'm I mean, like, this, come on. Let's just be honest. We're working on this okay. all this time. You know, we should be chills, get chills because we need we need oversight. And, and, and we yeah. need to be able to have people be held accountable for, you know, um, using data, you know, uh, incorrectly or inappropriately. And we're not there yet. People are, are, are yeah, yeah. it's kind of like as you said with, with, with uh, cryptocurrencies and things like that. It is literally, there's no regulation. There's no oversight. You know, there's no compliance. But but people, they, they want to be able to, to create revenue. They want to be able to, to scale, you know, like, you know, go to the moon. And um, in order to do that, you know, you need to kind of, let all of those regulations go to the side and, you know, because regulations tend to slow things down through bureaucracy, 
and through just oversight. But, you know, I'm like, mm. you know, with technology moving faster and with quantum computing, I mean, oversight, you know, is not going to be an issue. But, boy, I, it, you know, I, that it's just something that I encounter every day, you know, mm-hmm. dealing with data and yeah. getting people onboarded is that, you know, that there, there needs to be more accountability for the data. Fortunately, you know, the people and the companies that we work for, I mean, there's the real people and they're like, okay, you're training me for this. And they bring up those same questions because it's not like it's a mystery. It's literally the first questions that come up when you talk about data is, is about, you know, privacy and, you know, where is this going? How does it get, you know, deleted at a certain point? You know, what does it hold for the future, et cetera. And, and, and that is the, that's the one thing that, that, you know, I'd mentioned earlier that is very optimistic. Uh, with with mm-hmm. the companies I work with in Asia, is that the people that are becoming responsible for deploying these solutions, they're thinking about that data. They're thinking about, hey, you know, I'm in there, you know, potentially where I live, my phone number, you know, my relatives, people I interact with in, yeah. during business, or you know, it, it's a, they they're starting to get it and. That alone, the people, you know, collectively saying we need oversight is what is going to do it. And as I said, you got to focus on impact. Right, right now. Thank you. I think that's uh, very, uh, you painted a picture here, William, which I think I'm sure will be very useful to, uh, you know, our audiences and participants here. Um, so. And, 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 and so needed. Uh, indeed, we have two more minutes left in the, in, in the, in the panel, and just very quickly, I actually wanted to respond to what you said, William, around um, you know oversight of data, uh, where you know wanting to move fast, and I think yeah. we kind of see that globally. The narrative, I mean, the Silicon Valley uh, follows the Facebook mentality, as I call it, uh, move fast and break things. But then, you know, you're left with a lot of broken things. So yep. then, <laughs> you have to clean them up and and and. Uh, you know, the externalities, as we call it in economics, are spread over on a much wider set of uh, population. Uh, and then who's cleaning it and who's not is, is different. So, uh, you know, of course, we don't have to go into uh, the, the glorious Facebook story, uh, but we, we sort of see that unfolding. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So I just want to invite uh, the panelists here for just their final comments here. Maybe we can go in the same order as, uh, as we introduced uh, uh, them here. So Svetlana, Toshi and, and William, just 30 seconds. Uh, what would you want to leave the participants and the audience with today? What should they be looking out for? Uh, what I hear is simply that there's a lot of potential, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So I would actually invite everybody to join in. We need diversity in AI, in emerging tech. And with that, uh, I'll invite everybody to um, uh, invite here, uh, talk for uh, just five, 10 seconds here. Uh, I can see that our session time has actually lapsed. Okay, so I think it's important not to be afraid of using technology to address the concern that we expressed uh, because once people were afraid of the refrigerators, right? Because the people who sold the ice lost the jobs. So that's something we have to remember. Uh, But at the same time, we have to understand and be educated. What what does it bring with that? What the consequences are? And have to be really conscious about that as we go. That's pretty much it. Thank you, Svetlana. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, um, the AI is very beneficial. I completely agree with William. But it uses a lot of energy. Uh, in connection with the uh, the agreement of COP26. Uh, so we need to develop, uh, we call it green AI, which is a, a new way of uh, calculating the AI and uh, the algorithm. So that kind of technology development is imminent, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks for tying those, uh, connecting those dots here. All right, William, final 30 seconds. Great. Yes. Uh, you know, it, it really ultimately, as I said before, every stakeholder has their role to play. Um, we can all see where AI is going and how it impacts us, you know, in, in our various industries. Um, we need to be able to, you know, focus on its impact. As I had said before, you know, we can bring everyone together. We can bring everyone up in, with technology, but, you know, we need to do it together and we need to be able to have open dialogue and, uh, and, and open consequences, 
uh, which is something that uh, is that one piece that seems to be missing from a lot of regulation is enforcement. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, amazing stuff. Love it. Global collaboration is what we need. And uh, with that, uh, you know, I think that's a, it's a great closing to the session here. I want to thank everybody, Svetlana, uh, Toshi, and William. Thanks uh, to our participants for joining us. My name thank is you. Thank you so much. And we will see thank you, you. Uh, soon again. And please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. Cheers, everyone, and happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, happy, happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, you too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.